Hello, everyone. Today we're looking at rich and poor people in Elizabethan England uh, with the goal of examining the lives of both rich and poor people and what it was like to be alive in the 16th century. So to start us off, if you'd like to go ahead and pause the video uh, and just make sure that you have a good understanding of a definition for the following key words. So here we have poverty, monk, harvest, and inflation. This is not the inflation of a football. This is the inflation to do with money, something that we did cover uh, in our last lesson. Once you've got those four definitions, feel free to hit play and we'll carry on. So this might look familiar. We did look at this in our last lesson about food and fashion. We were just looking at the rough salaries of different jobs uh, in the 16th century. Uh, we did focus a lot on the queen and her salary, uh, but we're going to take a look at kind of normal people within reason. Uh, noblemen or a lord, they, they would be in the upper echelons of society and they were extremely wealthy. So we can see that they were making uh, roughly between 14 and 25,000 pounds per day. Um, and looking at their, their modern equivalent salary, you know, is three to five million a year. Farm workers, they would make much less. They were looking at about 700 pounds a year in terms of their salary. And this is quite similar to modern day England. We have a very low percentage of the population who earns a lot of money, and we have a very high percentage of the population that earns a lot less. This is something that we can see today that we will also translate into our study of rich and poor people in Elizabethan England. We're gonna look at poverty in context. Uh, we have to remember that we're going back to the 16th century, so this is 1500 to 1599, so nearly 500 years ago. Uh, and at this time, there was no NHS, there was no form of helping people who were disadvantaged in any way. Uh, in the modern climate with the coronavirus, where people are getting a portion of their salary to remain at home, uh, the, the government today has the power to be able to do these things, but 500 years ago, they simply did not. There was no system in place to help anyone who was poor. The government did not establish any means of helping those who needed help. Uh, that was often left up to the church and to the wealthy. It was seen as their responsibility to go and donate to charities and donate to the poor. This meant that about 30 percent, that's one in three people, lived on the verge of starvation. Now, Elizabeth, she was going to be the first monarch in history to try to tackle the problem of poverty. But it was difficult because she didn't really know where to start. She was expected to run the entire country from her own pocket, meaning that she couldn't use publicly funded taxes to help with poor relief. It had to come out of her own money. Now, one of the major issues she needed to solve was vagrancy. And a vagrant is a person who travels from place to place in search of work. They have no fixed address and they're essentially homeless. Now, vagrants cause a lot of problems. First of all, if they don't have anywhere to live, it's very difficult to tax them because they're always moving from place to place. Another major problem was the spread of disease. They would spend a very short period of time in small villages and towns moving from place to place, and with that they would also spread disease. Uh, they caused a lot of fear among the general population because when vagrants rolled up to your village, uh, crime rates would often increase, they would steal things, and they would also potentially cause social uprisings. So before we really get into some of the details, we need to know the key differences between rich and poor people. Uh, wealthy people tended to remodel existing homes, uh, or they would build their own larger homes, typically two or three stories in height, and they would always build them in a symmetrical shape of a letter E or a letter H. And there's a reason for that. There was a monarch named Henry and a monarch named Elizabeth. So we have two aerial shots of two different homes built in the kind of mid to late 1500s. Uh, we have Montacute House and we have Hardwick Hall. Uh, we can actually see, if we just rotate Hardwick Hall around, there we go, uh, we can actually see that letter. So we can see here we have actually two letter E's, completely symmetrical. And we have, again, symmetrical, we have that kind of letter H. Uh, this area in the middle would be known as the Long Gallery. Uh, and they would have windows on either side, there would be lots of paintings, it would be very well lit. 
You could have dinners or dances inside of the long gallery. It was a great place to entertain your guests. Uh, wearing exotic materials like silk and gold thread paired with vibrant colors, it was a really easy way to show off how much money you had. Food was more about just living. It was an event. If you remember back to our last lesson, we looked at a picture of some, a swan uh, where they removed the feathers in the skin, they cooked the swan underneath, and then they placed the feathers back on top. It was more than just the food, it was the, the visual experience of eating that food cooked in a very elaborate way. Access to education was mainly in the form of private tutors. Later on, you could go on to university to study things like French, Greek, or Latin, and you mainly would focus on studying the grammar of these three languages, which is why we have in today grammar schools. Some activities were reserved solely for the rich. We're looking at things like hawking, uh, where you would have a bird trained to go and fetch prey and bring it back to you, or hunting on private land. These were not allowed if you were poor. Now, regular Elizabethans, they had very small homes with few windows. It was often one room, a dirt floor, and really gross. You would often share your house with animals. Clothing was strictly functional, made of rougher, more durable fabrics and accessorized with a belt. Uh, on that belt, you would hook on a little leather pouch that you could maybe carry a few coins in. On the other side, you might have a knife or tools that you would need for the day's work. We already did talk about this, but 30% of people never had enough food to eat, and food was very much so for sustenance and survival. There was simply not enough time for education. While rich people went to have uh, private tuition, poor people were out in the fields working, and they didn't have time to go and learn how to read or write. What little learning they might do would be at an inn or a tavern where they would talk to other people in the village about you know, current events. And the last one, playing games at home, uh, maybe watching a play from the Groundlings or going gambling. These were all very popular things to do for the wealthy. Going back to the idea of food, uh, there's a quote from an author named William Harrison. He wrote a book called uh, A Description of England in 1577. Now, this has been slightly modified from its original Old English, but the message remains the same. He said, poor neighbors are forced to content themselves with rye or barley, and in really tough times, bread made from peas, beans, and oats. So when he's talking about the poor neighbors, he's talking about poor people in his village are forced to content themselves with, meaning they have to be happy with making bread out of rye or barley, which at the time wasn't incredibly different. Um, that's what a lot of bread was made out of. But interestingly, he says, in tough times, bread made from peas, beans, or oats. And this really shows the desperation of poor people, making bread out of literally anything that they can find. So the big question is, why were most people poor? There's nine reasons why most people in Elizabethan England were poor. Now remember, 30% of people lived on the verge of starvation. Uh, a much higher percentage had a very tough time and a very small percentage of the population was extremely wealthy. So there's nine main factors as to why poverty was a problem uh, in the 16th century. And it all starts off with rising inflation. So the way that prices work is called supply and demand. The less there is of a product, meaning the more people want it, meaning the higher the price can be. So if you look at something like a pen, there are millions of pens in the world. If you want a pen, you simply go to a shop and you can buy a pen for a very affordable price. But if there was a pen shortage, if all of a sudden pen factories shut down and couldn't make pens anymore, there would be less of them in the shops. And shopkeepers are quite clever. They know that they could charge more money for that pen because more people want it. This works the same with food. We've actually seen in the last few weeks, Lou Roll, uh, everyone was buying up Luro and the prices was slowly going up to purchase that because the demand was high while the supply is low. This mainly happened in Elizabethan England with food prices. With less food being produced, the prices are going to be raised and less people can afford it. Bad harvests. In 1556, 1596, and 97, really bad harvests caused a steep rise in the food prices. So again, linking back to rising inflation. The less there is of something, so the less food we have, the higher the price because the demand is much higher. 
New farming methods, this linked into inflation yet again. Farmers stopped growing food and they started raising animals. They did something called enclosure. They would take a really big field and they would put fences up all over and they would sell little plots of land to different tenant farmers uh, to kind of make a bit more cash for themselves. The problem with that is you need a really big field to grow a specific crop. And if you have very small fields, uh, it's very difficult to grow those crops effectively. Because they were raising sheep, you really don't need a lot of people to tend to sheep. So this meant most uh, people who were employed on the farms as laborers, they lost their jobs and they decided to move elsewhere. Rack renting. This is a increase in rents. Uh, and many people couldn't afford this and they would be evicted. Now, a lot of people were seeing rents go up because there were only so many houses and all of these farmers were leaving the countryside and they were moving into the towns and villages, which meant there was a higher demand on the housing market. This links into the rural depopulation. The unemployed farmers, they leave the countryside uh, and there's less homes in the towns and villages that are available. And of course, the highest bidder will get the rent. The dissolution of the monasteries, a rise in unemployment among monks, servants, and laborers took away vital roles within the charity relief. As we already alluded to before, it was the responsibility of the poor people and the church, sorry, the responsibility of the rich people and the church to help those who were in need. If you are sending monks out of the monasteries and they're now unemployed, they're not going to be able to serve the church and serve within that charity relief. Foreign wars and soldiers. Uh, wars with France, Scotland, and Spain, they caused taxes to rise, and this meant the value of money fell. This was inflation occurring within the English economy. Uh, after war was over, soldiers were unemployed, and many of them returned back to England with significant injuries, meaning they could not work on the farms as they had done before they joined the army. So this meant that they were now stuck in the life of vagrancy, moving from town to town, village to village, hoping that they could find work. Changes in the cloth industry. Uh, cloth was no longer being exported and many weavers lost their jobs. Again, going back to that supply and demand. The supply of cloth in England was quite high, but the demand for its export was quite low. And this means that those people who are weaving and spinning the cloth uh, no longer are needed and are going to lose their jobs. And our last one is a rising population. Uh, between 1540 and 1601, the population almost doubled. So we went from 2.7 million people to just over 4 million. And this caused a really high demand for food, clothing, housing. Prices just went up in general. Now it's time for our bonus facts. Sometimes the rich people actually pretended to be poor. So this is a unique case. Uh, there's not too many like it. So we have uh, two men here. They're actually the same man. So this is Nicholas Jennings uh, and this is Nicholas Blunt. They're actually the same guy. Now, Nicholas Blunt was a rich man who pretended to be sick and poor. He realized pretty quickly he can make more money begging on the streets than he could working an honest job. He was caught in London in 1566 with a bag of blood which he would paint these kind of horrific injuries on his head, hoping to earn a bit of money by people walking by. He could make 13 shillings in a day, and that was the equivalent of two weeks work uh, for a skilled worker, so someone who was, you know, building houses or a cabinet maker. Elizabethans lived in eco-friendly houses, so long before Cressex was an eco school, uh, there were wattle and daub houses. And this is where you have a timber frame. So we can see here on the right hand side, uh, timber frame, everything is perpendicular and square. You then take sticks or twigs and you kind of weave them in between your uh, wooden frame. And then you use a clay or a plaster to go on the outside of that. Uh, it was often painted white after it was all done, which we can see the finished product down here. Uh, and this acts as a really good insulator and is completely weatherproof as well. Now, people needed to make homes out of things that were easily available to them. And that's why wattle and daub houses were, were so popular at this time. Uh, 
they very seldom would have any windows. We can see here there's kind of two very small windows just to let a little bit of light in. One reason for that is Waddle and Dob houses, uh, they tend to kind of sink and list and, and shift over time uh, because the infill between the wooden beams isn't incredibly rigid. Second reason is windows were just expensive. Uh, making glass in the 16th century was a very difficult process. So to have a window, especially a large one, uh, you would only be able to do that if you were very wealthy. This is a, a Waddle and Daub house. Uh, this is actually in Aylesbury, about a, well, about a 10 minute drive north of Aylesbury. This was mentioned in the Doomsday Book. So people figure that there was a house on this site a thousand years ago, but this house itself is at least 550 years old. And we can kind of see that nothing is really straight and level. And if we have a look inside the house, here's the, the sitting room. We can see the wooden beams that were used for the ceiling. Uh, have bent a little bit over time, but also this is kind of their original shape, that it was difficult to find a completely straight and level beam to build with, and people would just build with whatever they could locate. Here we have the bedroom, and you wouldn't want to sit up too quickly, you might bump your head on the ceiling. Uh, and Waddle and Daub houses are, are quite common. Uh, sometimes they're referred to as Tudor-style houses, but this is one just down the road from where I live, uh, about a five minute walk away. And we can see the front of the house here is again that waddle and daub style. So we have the timber frame and then the infill in between painted white. Vagrants got pretty creative. So we talked about Nicholas Jen Jennings. He was a, a counterfeit crank. He was someone who pretended to be something he's not. Uh, but there's three that are quite unique. So uh, a hooker or an angler was a thief who would carry around a very long stick. And what they would do with the stick is they would soak the end of it in water uh, for a very long period of time to soften it. And they would slowly bend it into a hook. And this process would take a few days to, to do. But at nighttime, they would go round and stick that stick through a window and try to hook out uh, articles from inside. And they would use that to steal, to try to sell and, and make some money for themselves. Uh, an Abrams or an Abraham's man, uh, there were two names for this type of vagrant. They just pretended to be a lunatic. They would kind of rock, walk up to people and scream at them and show profanities in hopes that people would take pity on them. And a dumberer uh, is someone who would pretend that they were a mute, that they could not hear and they could not speak. Make sure you have a look on Show My Homework and complete the quiz your teacher set associated with this lesson.